But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. <clears throat> for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. A son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At the time Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me, to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. <clears throat> Let us sing now together our sermon hymn. <laughs> Dear hearers of the Word of God, grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Years ago, when, our, when we had moved to North Dakota, my wife and I went to South Dakota, to the famous uh, tourist area called the Black Hills. The tourist, uh, the tourist, I would say, not the Venus flytrap, but the tourist fly trap, right? It, it draws you in and you can't get out. One of the things that were there that we saw was this, Black Hills Maze. I thought, well, that'd be kind of fun to do that, take Sarah along and walk in there. How hard can it be, you know? It's just, it's one of those things. So uh, I took Sarah in, we were with a youth group in North Dakota, and we were walking around, 
And you can see there's, a, there's places to get above the maze. There's a, like a catwalk there. And you can kind of, if you get lost and stuck, you can, you can walk up the railing and then kind of find out where you need to go just in case you get lost. And I thought, who needs a catwalk? I mean, how bad can it be? Well, after about 45 minutes in the hot sun with Sarah crying in my arms saying, Daddy, we can't get out! We can't get out! You're lost, Dad, you're lost! I said, no, we're not lost. I finally went up on the catwalk. <laughs> I got a glimpse of where I was and where I needed to go. Fifteen minutes later, we're lost, Dad, we're never going to get out of here. I said, fine. I found a depression in one of the, it's pea gravel. You walk around the pea gravel. And I found a little depression underneath the thing. So I crawled underneath and I pulled Sarah out. We walked around to the front and I said, hi, honey. That was a fun maze. <laughs> I made it through. Not quite. Well, uh, I had no clue where to go and I was completely in over my head. Pride goeth before a fall. On the maps. Treasure map, right? Where do they put on the bottom? A compass rose, right? At least, the, at least they have one letter. What's the letter? N. What does that stand for? North. North. As long as you go N, you can have any number you want, I get the letter you want. But North is on top. Once you know where North is, you're okay. You kind of know what's going on. You can figure out the rest of the man. What Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew uh, gives us uh, a map with direction so that we can uh, negotiate and navigate through these mazes to help us get our bearings and what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Compass the same thing. Jesus says uh, about himself in the beginning of chapter 11, and we're in chapter 11 now. In the beginning of chapter 11, uh, John the Baptist has been arrested. John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. And they, they grew up together. They knew each other. I mean, all through life. John's arrested because he spoke to the, to the king, uh, to uh, Herod. Uh, you can't you can't be living with your brother's wife. Uh, she's married. You can't be doing that. That's you're cheating on her. You shouldn't do it. She gets mad, has him thrown in jail. He likes to hear parents. Uh, he's confounded by him. He's uh, he, in, in his mind. He's an enigma. I don't really you don't know this John, but you know what? He's speaking the truth, and he liked to listen to him. And uh, one night they had a party. And uh, Herod's wife's daughter danced for the crowd. And Herod was so enamored with this young girl dancing, he said, wow, I've never seen anything like it. You ask me anything you want, I'll give it to you. Even if it's half my kingdom. The girl goes like, wow, what, what should I ask for? Mother said, I know what you should ask for. John the Baptist's head on a platter. And she did. She asked him for that. She ran to the king. And he, now, now what am I supposed to do? If I say no, everyone heard me say, I'll give it to you, I have to do it. Well, that's what happens to John. Before he gets his head cut off and served on a platter, John is in prison waiting for the sentence, you know. And he's wondering if all this talk that he had about Jesus is true. In other words, John was telling everybody at the beginning of his ministry that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one that we've all been waiting for. His wintering fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor. The wheat he's going to separate from the chaff. The chaff he's going to burn. The wheat he's going to put in the barns. So repent. Be ready. Jesus is the one. Well, in prison, he has time to reflect, and he's wondering to himself, is Jesus really the one? He's 
not quite sure anymore. And when you're facing death, you have a lot of time to contemplate and thinking and all the things that you stood for in life. Was it all worth it? I was telling everybody that Jesus is the one. Is he really the one? And so Jesus, uh, John uh, sent his disciples, that were visiting and present, go to Jesus and ask him, are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? Jesus didn't say yes. He didn't say that. He says this, go and tell John what you see. The blind receive their sight. There's Jesus healing the blind man. It's from a Swiss painter, Kareem Bonish. The lame walk. Here's the man who's put through the roof in Mark's gospel. They tore, tore a hole in the roof and lowered the man through the roof. And he walked. The lepers are cleansed. An African painting here. The deaf hear. And the dead are raised. Here's raising of Lazarus from an Italian painter. And the good news. And the poor have good news preached to them. All of these are signs that the prophet Isaiah said are going to happen when the Messiah comes. So instead of saying, just speaking the word, are you the one who has to come? Should we look for another? Jesus doesn't say yes or no. He says, look at the deeds. Look at what I've been doing. Tell John what you see and hear. And for John, that was enough. It was sufficient. All of those things were indeed happening. All of them were signs of the Messiah. Now after John's disciples left Jesus, they went back to go tell John while he was in prison what Jesus told them to say. He now speaks to the crowd about John the Baptist. Here's John the Baptist. Uh, no one who has ever lived is greater than John. Okay, He is the fulfillment of prophecy. The Elijah, he dressed just like Elijah in the Old Testament. So he's like the prophet Elijah sent to prepare the way for Jesus. He stood on the threshold, on the edge of the kingdom, looking over, one foot here and one foot there. Uh, yet now in the kingdom of, uh, of God, uh, and in, in through Jesus, as the kingdom of God is breaking in through Jesus, John is at the edge, from the Old Testament, the Old Covenant to the New. He stands right, right there in the edge. And yet, even the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. And then Jesus has our gospel today. Kind of a cryptic saying. To what can I compare this generation? They don't listen to John. They don't listen to Jesus. Uh, John's, uh, shall we say, uh, Spartan or austere uh, habits of walking, living around in a camel chair coat, eating grasshoppers, and honey, and locusts, uh, turned people off. He, he didn't drink, he didn't do anything. He just lived out in the wilderness. They thought, that guy's nuts, he's crazy, he's got a demon. They didn't listen to him. Uh, Jesus has a habit of eating and drinking with sinners, associated with people that they shouldn't associate, he shouldn't associate with in their minds. And so they don't listen to Jesus either. And he says, Jesus says, what, what can that compare to this generation? You didn't listen to John, you don't listen to me. You're like kids uh, playing a game in the marketplace. You can't decide whether you play wedding games or funeral games. Uh, we, we play the tune and you didn't dance. We pipe the funeral dirge, you didn't dance either. We don't know what to do. And so he says, you're, you're a generation that doesn't know where to go. You don't know which way to turn. You're indecisive. Yet wisdom, Jesus ends the gospel, is vindicated, or in this section of the gospel, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. What does that mean? The proof is in the pudding. What is Jesus doing? He's doing exactly what 
God has sent him to do. He's not just talking. He's doing what God wants him to do. Why, then secondly, Jesus goes, well, why don't the wise see? What's, what, it, what is it about that? He's not condemning intellectual power or wisdom or, or getting an education. But the problem that happens when you get wisdom, what happens? Well, people start looking down on others. You know, you ever heard the expression, that guy's walking around, his nose scrapes the ceiling. What does that mean? Their nose scrapes the ceiling? How many of you have heard of that expression? You know? They're walking around, they're all high and mighty, think they're so smarter than the rest of us. The problem is, as you get smarter, they start to think, we got this all figured out. John, we didn't write the way John was doing it. Jesus, we got it figured out. Neither one of them was good. We're just waiting to see what happens next. The more power we have, the smarter we get, it is true, the, the more easily we aren't able to see the truth. And when the, then the truth comes, we don't want to face it. We don't want to face it. A naval ship was going in the Atlantic on, uh, near the, the Canadian coast, uh, near Newfoundland. And this is a transcript of the, of the uh, discussion between the Canadian, the Canadian and Americans, okay? The American captain of the aircraft carrier says, uh, please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid collision. The Canadian said, well, we recommend that you divert your course 15 degrees south to avoid a collision. You go first. No, you go first. The American captain said, this is a captain of the United States Navy ship. I, again, say, you divert your course. One, five degrees north. Better get out of this guy's way, right? Uh, Canadian said, no, you divert your course. One, five degrees south. Again, captain. This is United States ship Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic Fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, numerous support vessels. I demand you change your course one five degrees north. One five. Or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of this ship. The Canadians finally replied, this is a lighthouse. Your call. Now, you can probably Google this and find out, was it, did this really happen? You know what, well, it doesn't matter, it's true. It's, it's true. I am the captain of the sea. And, well, sorry, you're, we're light now, so you're gonna have to turn. Who should we follow? Who is really true? Uh, Jesus invites us to have a childlike trust, to trust in the Lord. There's an African proverb that goes like this. No one tells a child to look at the sky. No one tells a child to look at the sky. What Jesus claims in Matthew following is that he alone can reveal God to the world. He is the lighthouse that shines on the dark, the dangerous shoal. That no matter how powerful we are, uh, there's something we need to listen to. No matter how prideful we become. Or no matter how we want to think that, well, you know, in the end, religion is religion is religion. As long as you believe in something, that's enough. It doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe in something. Well, Jesus says, that's really not true. Uh, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, some people might not like it. They may argue against it and say, well, how can you say that? But it is nonetheless true. Uh, not all roads lead to the top of the same mountain. Some are simply dead ends. As, uh, as we said earlier, uh, Jesus uh, is, uh, there's only one north <laughs> on a compass, and Jesus is that for us. If we want the heart, if we want the mind, if we want the attitude, 
the nature of God, we look to Jesus. If we want to know God's disposition towards us, we look to what Jesus did. How did Jesus treat people? With compassion, with open arms. What did he say to sinners? <laughs> Go on your merry way, keep sinning? No. He told them the truth. That way is a dead end. That way is that's destruction. I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. He speaks the truth. He is the north. As the, the writer of, uh, in our Bible study on Wednesdays, <clears throat> we've been uh, looking at the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews says Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter. The author and finisher. The beginning and the end of our faith. Who do we look to when we run this race of faith? We look to Jesus. Who did it for us? Who is the beginner, the, the beginning and the end of our faith, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith? And those uh, that know this, those that follow Jesus, have been invited by himself, Jesus himself, to tell the good news that that's the truth. That God has said something to those who are lost. That God has provided a way out of the mess, out of the maze, by following Jesus. That's why at the end of Matthew's Gospel, we have uh, what's called the Great Commission. <coughs> what does it say? Go. <laughs> Go, therefore, making disciples of all nations. Finally, in this, uh, in this exchange today in our Gospel, Jesus... Uh, after he, he, he settles his identity and what he's there to do. Because the disciples were wondering, as well as John's disciples, Jesus' own disciples were kind of wondering, well, should we really keep following him? I mean, if John's unsure, then how, how are we so sure? Well, well Jesus settles it. He said, nothing, nothing comes to me except through God, and you can't tell God except through me, and nothing, nothing you know about me doesn't come except from God. That's the way it is. And finally, with his identity settled, with that question settled, Jesus offers an invitation. Come, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, exhausted and weighed down, and I will give you rest. Coming to the one and only Son of God, the true north, the one who is the way, trusting him, taking upon taking his yoke upon our shoulders, we are truly free from the burdens that we carry. We're no longer bent over uh, trying to carry loads too heavy for us. So what is the yoke uh, that Jesus offers us? Here's a, here's a picture of a, of a yoke, uh, a wooden yoke, oxen yoke. <clears throat> uh, following him, we can infer, well, it's following Jesus, his teaching, his way of discipleship. Uh, it's not burdensome, but it's life-giving. Uh, he invites uh, the weary to listen to him, to turn from others, to turn from those that aren't true, to the one who is true. Uh, Jesus says, I'm not a tyrant who lords it over you. I'm gentle and I'm humble of heart. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. The word easy is the word uh, krestos. Uh, you probably heard of that uh, the drug krestor. It's a Greek word for the best. So if you're wondering how, how they think of their product, well, now you know. <laughs> uh, or crest toothpaste, right? Well, krestos, crest, it means good or well-fitting. Or superior. My yoke is well fitting. It doesn't chafe. It doesn't make it worse. It allows you to do what? Carry more than you normally could. And notice how, how, how many animals is this yoke for? One? Just looking at that. How many know anybody in the team have harnessed up horses before? You know, oxen? There's two. It's two. Take my yoke, be yoked with me, join me, join me. 
He doesn't say, join me, to together we'll rule the galaxy, you know, that's not what he's talking about. He's, join me, my yoke is easy, my burden is like, you will find rest. You can endure. We are yoked to Jesus himself. He doesn't leave us alone. He invites us to follow him, to be his disciple. That's what the word said to me, to follow, to be yoked with him. He does not want to leave us alone, and he doesn't leave us alone. The problem with being leave, uh, we, uh, when we're left alone uh, is we don't even know we get ourselves lost. It's like, the, it's like the pastor said, we're like sheep. We just put our heads down and we nibble ourselves lost. We don't even know we're lost. We just keep nibbling away. To take his yoke means that we are connected to him. For only in Jesus can we find the rest that we desperately need. Is Jesus inviting us to a life of ease, therefore? Is that what he's saying? Follow me and all your troubles will be over and you'll be able to kick back. Well, no. We know that's not true. In fact, he's, he, he, he's the worst uh, in terms of, uh, of a PR campaign. Uh, he needed to get a better manager because he would always say, if you want to come in, you have to deny yourself and, you know, sell everything. <laughs> Don't say stuff like that, Jesus. Don't say you're going to be persecuted. Don't say that. You want followers, right? But he knows the truth. He's going to tell the truth. He is the truth. The challenges and the risks that will come with him being a disciple are abundantly clear. Jesus makes that clear. But he calls us to a life of service <clears throat> that is free because we're linked to him. A freedom and joy instead of being slaved to ourselves or just nibbling ourselves lost. It is life yoked to Jesus under God's reign, God's rule, God's commission. Free from the burden of guilt, of sin, the need to prove ourselves right and powerful. You turn. No, I'm not going to turn. I didn't demand you do it. Enough of that. Free to rest deeply and securely in the grace that God has provided for us in Jesus. Take my yoke upon you. Follow Jesus. He shows us the way. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please stand.